what's changed along the way. So when Inside Analytical started five years ago now, so it's kind of cool, we just had our fifth anniversary. We basically really started with one product line. We were working with JP3 measurements. I've been consulting with these guys, helping with them look at their spectrometer and what kind of applications they're gonna do. And that was really the raison d'etre, if you like, for Insight. We came around because we were gonna launch and bring this new technology to Canada. And by the way, it is cocktail time. And for Jaden, he made the little glass clink on the website. So I actually put ice in my scotch just for you, buddy. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are and then uh, go from there really to talk more about what's new and how we've changed over the five years and specifically what kind of product lines we've brought on because we've done a lot of stuff over time. So, you know, we're a Calgary based integrator and um, uh, we have full systems integration capabilities right here in Calgary. We're a manufacturer's rep and distributor, and we develop a lot of our own components along the way, as you'll see. So I'm going to talk about those kind of all the way through this presentation. We run out of a pretty big shop. We got access to about uh, 40,000 square feet, about nine bay doors, full overhead crane to bring an analyzer building in and out. So we'll do everything from designing custom sample systems, process analyzer integration into systems, do all the PLC and automation work. I know it's Doug's on here and Jessica's on here. They've been working on a bunch of the PLC work that we do with along with some of the analyzers we put out. And as I mentioned, we'll do full buildings. The other thing you know, that some of you are probably aware of, I teach a course along with Tony Waters um, and a couple of other people, we teach a course on how to design analyzer sample systems. So. When we talk about process analyzers and sample systems, that's kind of right in our wheelhouse. It's where we grew up from. I came to this from a company called Western Research, managed their engineering group there, where we basically did all the systems integration that you see for most of the Amatech stuff that goes out there. You know, when we, we'll work on these projects from start to finish. So we'll start at a front end engineering design for a refinery or petrochemical plant move that through detailed design and engineering, take that along, do the full fabrication side of it, do commissioning and startups. And of course, everything we do, we pride ourselves on providing exceptional service for all of our products. And so we have a great service team. They uh, are completely committed to what we do and completely committed to making sure our clients are happy with what we do. As I mentioned, one of the first products that came online was the JP3 analyzers uh, from the JP3 Virax. JP3 is a company out of Boston, Texas. Near infrared spectrometer. We primarily use this for hydrocarbon analysis. In Canada, we've largely done liquids. In the US, they've done a number for gases as well. But our big applications up here have been condensate stabilizer optimization. You know, when you come into a gas plant, the first thing you hit after the inlet separator is often a condensate stabilizer. And by optimizing how that runs, vapor pressures and chemical composition, we can um, improve product yields and basically the analyzer starts to print money over time. Another application that prints money is crude oil blending. It's an analyzer sitting on a crude oil blending skid down here. And what we do with this fellow is basically, again, there's a vapor pressure spec on crude oil. So we can adjust how much butane we actually add into the crude and are able to increase production volumes and increase revenues. As well, we have our clients looking at it for pipeline quality, the products that are coming in and moving out, as well as uh, a lot of work on gas plant optimization, C3 plus streams, C5 plus streams, um, I know it's Troy is on and we've been working with Troy on, an app, on applications like that. Um, big features for this is virtually no maintenance. We can do the things that a gas chromatograph does, chemical composition, along with the things that a physical property analyzer does all at once. We had one client who when they spec the analyzer in or the engineering company spec the analyzer in, they asked for a butane measurement and by the time it was on site, they were saying, we'd like to do a full C1 through C12 and vapor pressure. Same hardware, no changes. Fast response gives us better process control system 
and we have large flow paths. So we can go on to dirty streams. You know, when we get things like a, a crude or a condensate that looks like this, you know, dirty and black and lots of asphaltines, try to put it through the sample systems for a conventional analyzer and the system plugs off. Large flow paths, no regulators, no filters means that we can just run directly through and give you continuous readouts. We also carry the, uh, the COSA Zentar analyzer, Wobi index and carry index analyzer. These are basically for burner controls. This is a measurement of how much air do I need to be adding to my fuel in order to get the best burn ratios. So typical applications up here have been SAG-D steam generators. So anytime you're gonna run a steam generator, you're often burning natural gas. If the gas is more rich, you gotta add more oxygen in. So you wanna have an analyzer that says, as the gas quality changes, I'm gonna change my air to fuel ratios. Same thing for gas turbine controls. Rich fuel burns out turbines, gets the flame too hot. So if we've gotta be careful about this and make sure we've added enough oxygen into there. Main feature of this is industry proven residual oxygen measurement. It's probably the most common way of doing Wobi index. It's fast, it's precise, good linearity, because it's really wide measurement ranges, very little to it in terms of complexity, low maintenance, and so we can do this measurement um, in real time, continuously while doing burner controls. We have the pleasure of also working with Mark Metrics. I see Bob's on here, and uh, Bob knows this technology quite well. Um, process Raman spectroscopy. So Raman is a different type of spectroscopy than the near infrared, but it's another method of using light to interrogate a sample and find out things about its chemical composition. The unique thing about Raman is that it can actually do things like inerts, like nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. It can do all those homonuclear diatoms that near-infrared spectroscopy can't do. So we can do a full natural gas composition along with the oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And this is becoming important because a lot of pipelines are starting to look at adding hydrogen into their natural gas. Conventional GCs have difficulties with this. They're using helium as a carrier. There's not enough difference between the, uh, the thermal conductivity of the helium and the hydrogen. So all of a sudden they have to go to dual carrier systems or other ways of doing that measurement. Another good application for this is doing things like amine acid gas, CO2, H2S, H2O, and hydrocarbons. All in one stream, everything can be measured at line pressures again. It's kind of like one of the unique things with that infrared analyzer is we can do things at line pressures and line temperatures. Small package, easy to place and uh, to locate and find a place for it. Um, kind of wireless remote operations. Calibrations are really stable. One of the advantages over NIR is that the models are a lot simpler to build on these things. Everything tends to be linear on these things. It's gonna show a little spectrum of kind of what happens with a natural gas type sample. So in with a Ramon analyzer, you get these nice unique peaks. So we have the propane peak sitting over here, ethane peak. Methane is in the middle of a bunch of these other guys. We have oxygen and nitrogen in here. So we can measure all of these components simultaneously based often on unique peaks. Less spectral overlap, simpler modeling. We have the privilege of working with Hawk. Hawk is one of the largest distributors of um, level and sensors and technologies to the mining industry in Australia. And they've, they're pushing their way in through North America and into Canada. And so we represent their products through Western Canada. And one of those is a guided wave radar system. Gives us continuous and precise level measurement and can measure multiple interfaces. So if we're in things like a um, inlet separator, where we've got water at the bottom and then a hydrocarbon layer and then a gas layer. Well, we can find all three of those layer points. So we can get, basically we know where the bottom of the tank is, we know where the water level is, and we know where the hydrocarbon level is. We can do multiple level measurements off of one technology. Typical applications have been mining and mineral processes, storage vessels, 
oil and NGL storage and processing terminals, chemical and petrochemical ter terminals. Low power device that can be powered right over an ethernet cable. So run data cable out to it, bring both data uh, and you bring power out to it that way and bring data back. Immune to pressure, temperature, viscosity, foam, changes in dielectric constants so we can get a very precise level measurement in some of the more difficult applications where other technologies have typically failed or reported false values. Chelsea, you may have to help me because when I brought this back up, I think I don't have the version that marks where my poles are supposed to be. Okay, okay so are you, well, one sec, let's... Take a look at the end of pole one. I think it ends here at Guided Wave Radar. Okay, so guys, for anybody that came on a little bit late, we are asking for your help. Um, every five lines or so, we are having, we've got polls to find out what you guys want to hear more about next. Um, the idea is that this is a series, so this is a full line overview, and then the next ones will be really what you guys want. It's like a choose your own adventure book. <laughs> Fun. So, so this, yeah, Hawk is the last one here. So I'm gonna we'll go ahead and launch this poll. It'd be awesome if you guys wouldn't mind putting your answers in, so we know where to go next. So it looks like about 10 people have answered, so we can probably go ahead and move on. Yeah, that. yeah, that'd be perfect. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. For some reason, I'm not seeing them. Oh. Do you want me to share the results for these, though, or just keep them? Sure, yeah, share the results. That'd be great. Can you see them? No, because we're logged in on the same account. Oh, sorry. I still have one for you. Yeah. yeah. So you just tell us who's tell us what number one was. Okay, so tell me what number one was. So number one with five votes is inside analytical systems integration capabilities. Oh, cool. We have zero for JP3 Virex near infrared spectrometers. Spectrometers. Sorry, spectro is that correct? Spectrometer? Yeah. Okay. Um COSA Zentor Wobe Index Analyzers, two. Mm -hmm. And then Mark Metrics process um, RAM and spectroscopy, 33%. So next cool. insight, it's that one. And then a hawk has got only one vote for um, yeah, hawk guided wave radar. Right on. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for the feedback. I mean, it's nice because, like as Chelsea's saying, we're planning to start to do these regularly. And so this is going to help us guide kind of the order we're going to go through some of those things in. So I'm going to move on to some of these other products that we talk about. Oops, here we go. So one of the other things that we do at Insight is we build composite samplers primarily for volatile liquids. So these are for things like C3 plus streams, C5 plus streams. So LPG, what we call in Canada LPGs oftentimes, what the US would refer to as Y grade. C5 plus streams, condensates or natural gasolines, crude oils. We want to build up those samples in a large accumulator over a period of time. And so we have these large accumulator vessels sitting over here. And what we do is for every certain number of barrels or cubic meters that goes by, we inject a sample into that vessel and fill it up. And then a sample is taken off of that vessel to, uh, to the lab periodically, sometimes over a period of days, weeks, even a month. And that gives us a composite or an average sample of what has been flowing through that pipeline. You know, again, typical applications, custody transfer onto pipelines, um, ship loading and offloading. We have a few of these out where they're loading LPG or propane onto ships to send over to Japan. As they load the ship, they fill up the composite sampler, and then that tells them over three days it took to fill this ship. This is the average composition of the propane we put on that ship. And then custody transfer in and out of fractionation plants. Big features of this is these are fully customizable. There are other people doing composite samples up here, but you know, in Canada, we have things like CRN numbers, 
where we have to have sort of pressure vessel requirements, certain pressure vessel requirements. And so we've built a system we can customize and modify to meet client needs and make sure we still meet all those pressure vessel requirements. We integrate in a lab sampler, so it's easy to pull samples. You kind of see down here, we put in this little color-coded valve assembly down there, and it's all part of trying to make this operator friendly so that they can easily pull a sample when they want to and fill a cylinder to take to the lab. So we simplify and color code a lot of operations. You know, when you have an object that somebody might not touch for a month, you wanna make it easy for them to remember how to work on it. And then American Petroleum Institute 8.2 um, code sort of describes a lot about how you're gonna do composite sampling. So everything we've done on here, we've made sure it's compliant with API 8.2. We have a joint venture agreement with Software Experts. Software Experts is a consulting and service company that does gas plant, sulfur plant, refinery optimization. And uh, we work with them because they're very interested in sampling and we love doing sampling projects. And so big applications for Software Experts has been sulfur recovery unit testing at gas plants and refineries, amine unit testing, amine stripping for acid and gas injection and things like that natural gas dehydration optimization, glycol dehydes, selexol dehydes, and then just general gas plant testing, improving recovery efficiencies and optimizing plants. We're really pleased to work with them. These guys were the, old, the original Western research guys started as testing sulfur plants back in the 60s and 50s. And so sulfur experts grew out of them. We're proud to be their partners. They have very sophisticated lab methods that they can bring out to the field to do field analysis. They'll do full engineering design and optimization. They actually wrote a salt package called SolSim to simulate sulfur plants. And they give training courses all over the world on sulfur recovery, amine unit optimization, and dehydration. We're working to help bring another brand new technology to bear which is uh, from a company called Perceptive Sensors. These guys grew out of some department of, uh, or some military contracts in the US where they wanted a technology that would allow them to look inside of a barrel or look inside of a bomb or look inside of a shell and say, is there a war chemical warfare agents inside there and what is it? And so these guys use a, a technique called acoustic fingerprinting, which allows us to look through the walls of a pipe or a tank and identify fluids inside of it. So common applications for this has been transmixing pipelines. We try to show that here, you know, if we're flowing, uh, say jet fuel down the pipeline on this side, and then we wanna start flowing some gasoline, I can't write in red over top of that red, I suppose, eh? If we start bringing in some gasoline over here, well, there's a period between the two where no product is on spec. And we refer to that as the transmix. And that has to be put to storage and reprocessed. A lot of guys do that just on the basis of time. They go, well, we've been, we switched fuels 30 minutes ago and we figured the transmix takes about 30 minutes. So we're probably okay. Now we can put a device that we strap onto the outside of the tank do a, or through a pipe, measure right through the pipe walls, the speed of sound and some other uh, acoustic properties of the material and from that interpret what materials are inside there. Another thing that's come out has been API 20, 2350. And this refers to how much we can fill a storage tank. Basically, when you were filling storage tanks, you would have to have a high level sensor and you are allowed to fill to that high level sensor. The amount of space you had to leave at the top was determined by the size of the pump that was feeding the tank and how long it could take you to detect an off uh, or a improper fill, if you like, and how long it was gonna take you to shut in. And so they often left 10% at the top of the tank. API 2350 has said, you can fill the tanks fuller if you add an additional level sensor that's not on the same network and not on the same technology. So the difficulty with that is we often put level sensors through the tank wall. In this case, we can strap or attach the uh, level sensor on the outside of the tank, separate 
data communication system and make it so we have a high, high level sensor and add 5% capacity to the tank. So the important thing with that is it means we can put more volume into there. We've also got a product that's just coming out. We're just getting our first demo unit up here, a portable ID. And it basically allows us to go around and uh, take a device out in the field, put the sensor on the side of a tank or pipe, and we can tell you what's inside there. So if you've got a rail car coming in or a truck coming in, you're going, well, is it Condi or is it LPG? We'll be able to put this device on the side of the tank and tell you what's in the, inside the, the tank. We also work with Amatech and Universal Analyzers on their Model 1221 distillation probe. If any of you are familiar with the old pie gas samplers, the fluid data pie gas samplers that were commonly used in uh, ethylene plants and propylene plants, this is kind of like a new version of that. Um, same sort of applications, ethylene, propylene, naphtha furnaces, any place where we're doing cracking, where we're taking big hydrocarbons and breaking them, there's a risk of producing soot. And there's a lot of steam there. And these types of samplers are ideal for these dirty streams where there's a lot of particulate, a lot of steam, and we can use it to clean a sample up, return all the things that we purged out of it back to process and make a measurement of a, a much more pristine system. Big things about this one is it has a superior, superior distillation tray design. It's really good at doing that separation and better temperature control. Really easy to maintain, this one piece pulls out all the distillation trays, so you can clean it and put it back together easily. Is that where my poll is, Chelsea, or do I have one more? We've got one more. The last Thanks. One. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Salton, Hawk Salton Acoustic Wave Sensors. So all of us are familiar with ultrasonics. The Acoustic wave sensors take a lower frequency and a much higher power, and it allows them to have better penetrating capabilities. And so, you know, you can see what one of the big benefits of this device is, is that it can be in applications where the sensor itself is going to get coated with all kinds of material and dirt and crud. So this is again in a mining operation. You can see another one sitting up here, and it's where they're bringing ore into a chute. So again, we've got lots of dust, dirt, particulate around it. And the sensor can just sit there and continuously measure level in those environments. So we can also use it for uh, positioning and collision protection. So we can use these sensors beside two vehicles to say, if I'm going to pull an ore truck up beside a, uh, a loading truck, I can make sure they don't get too close. So I don't have a collision. Again, this detection is basically a level and distance detector. So we can use it in multiple different applications. Gives us the ability to measure level and flow and common facilities we put these in, mining, power plants, chemical water, uh, treatment facilities, waste and wastewater facilities. Big thing is non-intrusive, doesn't have to touch the fluids. Self-cleaning sensor, they use the sonics and the ultrasonics to actually vibrate the sensor tip and keep the, the head of the sensor clean. Specialized circuitry and algorithms to adapt how much gain they have and make level measurements in these difficult environments where typically sensors get too heavily coated with foreign material. So common applications for this has been out in places like coal mines and things like that. We were, we were just recently out at the Tech Cominco mines and so. All right, is that where my poll is, Chelsea? is indeed. Thank you. Slap me and stop me. There you go, guys. And so just as you guys are looking at that, you can probably see like kind of where the interesting thing for me has been and for insight has been, has been to, has been to, been to watch us adapt from um, being kind of a one or two product company and having to carry these uh, increased product lines. So we've had the pleasure and the benefit that, you know, during COVID we've added on probably three people 
Um, Jaden, who's on here, who did a lot, does all of our graphics design. Jessica is on here, uh, instrument instrumentation technician working with us. And, uh, and Chris, it's on, uh, on the sales side because we brought on new products and Chris has handled a lot of the Hawk stuff for us. Okay, so we've got everybody answered now. And awesome. Go for it and show the results and then guide you through it because you're blind. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, the top one is perceptive sensors, trans mix level and field ID. Um, that has cool. six votes. And then sulfur experts, plant testing and optimization has three. Universal analyzers, uh, one, sorry, one, two, two, one. Is that how you actually say that? Or do they say it differently? 1221. 1221, I figured. As soon as it was coming out of my mouth. Yeah. Not that I'm not paying attention. No. Distillation probe also has three votes. And then uh, we've got Hawk, Salt, and Acoustic Wave sensors have, have two. And then inside analytical composite samplers have one. Cool. Great. Carrying on. So perceptive is up to us. Interesting. Good. It's fun for us because we've you know we've kind of started out as always an R and D guy, so we like to say we're bringing new technologies on board, and this is certainly a new one. It's really a fairly recent launch, and um, we're quite excited to bring it up to Canada. Again, back to the Hawk. You know, we they have multiple. We have multiple different level technologies that we can use in different applications, and they're they're really targeted to be kind of application specific. And the Orca sonar system allows us to use another acoustic type device that are high power acoustic pulse that we allow it to bounce down, go through the water. And the important thing is, is we'll see things like thickeners. You know, when people are trying to do things like um, put in anti-flocculation materials or, or flocculators to try to make all the particles come together. You know, we can go down and look at where's the clear water, where is that flock and fluff flare that's down near the bottom, and where is it actually solidified. So we can control wastewater clarifiers and thickeners. We can use this for chemical dosing systems and apply cost savings there by controlling dose rates. And the big thing, again, is about these transducers is the ability to do some self-cleaning of themselves and microprocessor-based algorithms to really pick up that dual density interface, where the clear fluid is, where the non-clear fluid is, and separate those two as two separate measurements. So we kind of show that here. Let me zoom on this guy, I think. So, you know, when we've got the sensor in there, we can have, you know, this clear zone of fluids. I can't draw one that's expanded. So it has this clear zone, which is, you know, where's, basically water. And then we end up with a zone that we often refer to as a settling zone. And it's gonna be where the particulate that was in the water has almost settled out, settled out, but it hasn't quite compacted yet into mud at the bottom. And so we get this thicker viscous layer, sometimes refer to it as a hindered zone. And we can use this technology to determine how thick that layer is. And we can use that to then adjust uh, the amount of uh, clarifying agents or flocculating agents that we're adding to the pool to try to make it clear up faster. Inside also makes a, a line of automated grab samplers. So, you know, we often see many refineries, petrochemical plants, gas plants, where the people are having to go out in the field and pull a sample. And, and that's all fine, except when we talk to the labs, they tell us the biggest problems we have with samples that come to the lab or either the person who pulled it didn't pull it properly and allowed the system to flash or vent and change phase while they pulled the sample. Or they did things like didn't write down the temperature, pressure, location, time, all sorts of custody transfer type information. None of that got recorded properly. So we try to address all that with putting sample cylinder ends in, whether they're floating piston type cylinders like you see here, or glycol displacement cylinders, the standard sort of thing that we often refer to as a sample bomb uh, over here. And I just put this one on its side because it fit on the slide better that way. Um, but we put these in and it allows us to pull a sample while the fluid stays under pressure. So we don't get a phase change. Typical application. Hmm? I was just wondering that one on the right, is that the uh, Simonette system? Uh, it Troy, is, yeah. For uh, Troy's benefit anyways. 
Yeah, yeah. So yeah, for Troy's benefit, this one over here is Simonette. And of course the other one up there is, um, I think KET, or is, is yeah. KET four streams? Yeah, or four cylinder, that one, or, or it could be CDH. Those yeah, it's either K, so Simonette and CDH, so. Um, yeah, and so they allow us, what they do is they allow us to be able to pull a sample at any time under any conditions without operator intervention except for somebody to trigger it. And it can in fact be an analyzer that triggers it. So we, any inferential analyzer, a near IR, an NMR analyzer, a Raman analyzer can say, this stuff doesn't look right. It doesn't look like what's in my model. Sends a pulse out, tells the PLC, fill up a sample. So we automate that sample pull and it's done whenever it needs to get done. Done the same way every time because it's under PLC control and we get all that chain of custody information because the PLC is recording all the data as it pulls the sample. Ends up being safer for operators because if I've got a volatile sample or one that has toxics in it or combustibles, I don't have to worry as much about an operator doing it incorrectly and having a leak while he's pulling the sample. Places we've commonly put this has been in, in with analyzers, train and truck loading operations, off loading and offloading. People often want to take a sample when they unload, offload a truck or offload a rail car. This way they can automate that whole process. We can put this in a refinery and do process monitoring of vessels, or we can put it as part of a custody transfer system and pull samples um, at any time during pipeline monitoring. Another level technology, another, um, another radar-based device. The unique thing about this one is it has a really narrow beam. And so a lot of these devices, when they, whether it's sonar or whatever, they put out a fairly wide beam path. And as a result of that, they can bounce off of neighboring objects and confuse the level measurement, if you like. And so the unique thing with the senator, it has this narrow beam. So here it's going through a bit, what they refer to as a grizzly, but basically a bunch of bars that are used to separate things. And it's shooting the beam through those to measure the height of ore that's sitting down underneath there. So we can use this in situations where there's interfering devices potentially. Again, it's got lots of power. So it can go through dusty, dirty environments, ash pits, ash silos, and things like that. We can go in the mining side, we can go on crushers and surge bins, places where generally there's a lot of things floating around that we can think of as being interferences. And so it allows us to take a level measurement in these difficult environments. And it can be level of liquids, solids, we can use it in multiple different applications. The big thing is when we go into those applications, you have to have the right algorithms to get rid of all the backscatter that occurs and you need really high power pulses. So Chris, do you remember how much higher the pulse on the on this radar was one is than the typical ones? I know Graham's mentioned the number and I, I lost it right now. It's typically about three times more powerful than traditional technology. So that extra power allows us just to get through dirtier environments. We, um, we work with Atom Instruments. This is basically um, a device to measure total sulfur in often in hydrocarbons, really total sulfur in any kind of stream. It is um, you know uh, very similar, if you like, to the thermal sola with a more advanced type of light source and sample handling system. So it does elemental analysis for sulfur and or nitrogen. So the typical applications of this will be things like natural gas and LNG products. You know, US, we would think of Y grade. For us, we might think of, you know, LPGs or propanes or C3 plus streams. But, and we also do butanes and condensates. So it works by taking a sample of the fluid that it wants to measure, mixing it with air, burning it so that all of the sulfur turns to NO2, the nitrogen turns to NO, and then measuring the total amount of SO2 or NO produced. It's a common way, it's an ASTM method, so this is all based on an ASTM standard. Um, 
It's an ASCM standard measure, method, method for doing total sulfur. And we, this, we're allowed, this technology allows us to bring that into uh, online measuring applications. Patented type of light source technology gives them a much better spectral purity, less interferences, very fast response times. And again, they don't need any carrier gases like you might have if you're gonna put in something like a GC to do total sulfur. Spectra sensors, very well known for tunable diode laser spectroscopy. So they have a proprietary TDLAS. Typical applications are things like moisture, CO2 and H2S and LNG and natural gases, H2S and flare and fuel gas. Um, it could be H2S and CO2 probably in coal gasification and coal liquefaction. Ammonia measurements for ethylene purity at ethylene plants. So guys like, uh, and same in propylene. So guys like Heartland, um, IPL's new polypropylene plant, maybe looking at things like ammonia measurements throughout there. Um, anytime you're making hydrogen, there's a possibility of making ammonia that you don't want. And so one of the common places analyzers this get used in applications like that. Very fast response times, low maintenance, no contact, no moving parts. So we can put a very reliable measurement in place. There's a poll for this one. I thought that was a spot. Thank you. Can I go for it now or do you? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Cool. Sorry, Jaden, the jingle's gone, the ice has melted. And guys, sorry, that top one's supposed to be Hawk. Obviously there's a little spelling error there. Uh-oh, did somebody not catch his spelling errors? Yeah, oops, yeah. Bill, this is Sherman. Hey, Bob. Yeah, LNG, you actually mean cryogenic or are you talking about LPG? No, is this would actually probably would be more on the NGL or vapor, sorry. Okay. It'd be more natural gas or vaporized LNG. One of the places it's come up is actually looking at the, the gas going into the cryo side because they want to make sure they're really low on H2 on moisture and CO2 before they run it into the cryo plant. And so the fast response and low detection limits lets them do the inlet natural gas into the cryo unit when they're making LNG. Okay, we've got 13 answered. If anybody else wants awesome. to in real quick, go for it. Otherwise, I'll just end this guy. Perfect. Okay. And boom. Awesome. Okay, so this one we've got almost a tie for three of them. So um, atom instruments, total sulfur in gas and liquids, inside analytical automated grab samplers, and pressure sensors, tunable diode lasers are each have four votes. So those are all five for the next one. And then uh, in fourth place is Hawk Senate, Hawk oh. Senate the free space radar. And then nothing for the Hawk support the sonar level. Okay. Ruby? Cool. Intr yeah, awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, we have a Curtis who's just trying to come in. And what if that's Curtis Cowell? I just received him. If that's Cowell, Jason, yell at him. <laughs> I'm working on it. Got my scotch awesome. into me so I can yell at him now. Awesome, bro. <laughs> um, okay. So a couple more rounds, of these. Like, as you can see, this is what I was talking about, you know, we brought on a lot of product lines and a lot of new things. And so on the COSA side also, there's the Zentar side of their product line. And the Zentar side is aluminum oxide moisture sensors. And these aluminum oxide sensors have been around for a while. People often think of them as a panometric side. Again, there's been improvement made in the centering process and how they put these sensors together. Um, but similar sorts of applications, you know, this is for natural gas and hydrocarbon processing. The nice thing, about, neat thing about these is you can do moisture in um, gases uh, and liquids. So if you're looking at things like trace moisture and LPGs and things like that, you can use a sensor like this to do uh, low level moisture measurements in liquefied products. Common applications, again, is often in the gas processing side, but also in trying to protect catalysts. Again, some of the catalysts that we use are really sensitive to moisture, and if moisture gets on the catalyst, it destroys it. 
And so it's important that we do a moisture measurement of the fluids that are going into that catalyst bed to ensure that we don't get it wet, and damage the catalyst. Heat treating in the steel industry, so we see a lot of these on the, on the um, steel and metallurgical side. And then in industrial gases, you know, these can be quite inexpensive uh, sensors. So another common place for these is in things like instrument air sensors and glove boxes and things like that. So maybe lab applications or in a processing facility for an air moisture sensor. Re potentially really low ranges on these. You'll talk, hear people talk about doing things like minus 60 and minus 70 degrees C dew points. So they can go quite low. Um, we can do automated field calibration and validation. These sensors are, are calibrated back to a NIST standard. So again, you know, we can get a high degree of reliability in these at a reasonable price, provided we, again, we have certain requirements on the stream composition that the aluminum oxide has to be compatible with. Dithiazine is a kind of a unique chemical. It's kind of grown into a little life of its own all of a sudden. It's a, it's, it's a new kit on the block for measurement. So we, the oil and gas industry often uses a chemical called triazine, and it's there to scrub H2S. So triazine reacts with H2S and converts the H2S gas into a chemical called dithiazine. And dithiazine is a pretty big molecule. It's got a molecular weight of 165. It's got really low vapor pressure. Everybody expected it was just gonna stay in the scrubber tower. But what they found is that it can get into the natural gas pipelines. It can get into natural gas liquids. And when it does, and it goes through a pressure or a temperature change, it can start to plate out. And so this chemical has been responsible for shutting down compressor stations by going across a regulator and plugging off the flow to a gas turbine engine, like a Rolls-Royce, a lot of these big compressor stations use like Rolls-Royce jet engines that are being used to compress the gas. And this chemical plate note in the lines can shut down the fuel flow to them. And so we were just talking to another client who had issues with, um, he's removing methanol from his LPG and the methanol helps the dithiazine stay in solution. When he takes the methanol out, all of a sudden he gets all this particulate and he plugs off his demethanol de tower is deoxygenate tower. So we can have, we want to be able to measure this because we want to protect rotating equipment and compressors, and we want to prevent service interruption in systems. The problem is it's typically down in the parts per billion levels. The only reason it becomes a problem is there's so much flow. So what we've done at Insight is work with um, TC Energy pipeline guys, put it vertically here since there's a white spot for me. Um, we've worked with TC Energy and developed these test panels that go out in the field. They have a little absorber column on them. We let it run out in the field. The dithiazine absorbs on this absorber column. It gets sent back into the lab and we are able to do a lab analysis and determine how much dithiazine was in the pipeline. So we've got efficient systems for measuring these things at the parts per billion system. We've got about 30 of these out there now. Um, they're easily field deployable. You have very good measurements at low levels. I mean, our typical ranges have been kind of like from 0 0.1 to 15 parts per billion. And this is kind of considered where, when we're getting up into the, we have a real problem here. The other thing we've done is we've developed these unique little test kits. It's an awful analogy, but if you watch the TV shows, those cop shows where they want to test to see if something's cocaine and they put a bit of powder in a vial and they shake it up and if it changes color, they know it's cocaine. Well, same thing. We have this crystal clear blue solution and you put in a little bit of the powder that's on a filter or on a regulator stem or from, been scraped out of your pipeline and add it into the solution and shape, shake it up. And the more dithiazine that's there, the more color change you're gonna get. And it's remarkably sensitive. If you look down here, this nice clear blue one is no dithiazine. Next to it was 0.48 of a microgram. 
So this is probably, this is not quite the head of a pin. This is smaller than a flea. Tiny little particle of dithiazine, and we start to see the color change right away. And you see, we get more and more color change the more dithiazine there is in the sample. So we can use this on liquid phase samples, on solid phase samples. We've done this with crude oils and condensates. Um, it allows us to determine if the chemical that's being used to scrub H2S is carrying over into our pipelines. Alpha Omega instrument provides us another oxygen measurement. We can do oxygen and trace levels and percent levels. These are often lab and um, industrial type applications. Things like bioreactors and fermentation vessels, waste gas monitoring off of plants, welding to, uh, boxes. So if you've got a, uh, uh, if you're trying to do a welding operation under a, a purge environment where you want a nitrogen purge around everything, you can be looking for the PPM levels of oxygen in there, glove boxes and labs. Convenient little sensor, EQM type sensor that works very well for these kinds of applications. A very unique product out of Hawk is the Praetorian fiber sense. And Praetorian comes from the, the Romans, the Praetorian guard, about protecting things. And so Praetorian is a fiber optic cable that we can run along the length of a conveyor system or run it along the length of a pipeline, tens of kilometers, and measure along the entire length of the fiber at about half meter intervals. So you know, tens of kilometers of measurement every half meter, every, no printy well, every one half meter. And we get a measurement of vibration, potentially a measurement of vibration, temperature, and strain. So in things like conveyor belts, there's always these little idlers. They're part of the roller system that the conveyor belt moves on. And as they wear, the idlers can wear out. And as they start to wear out, or if the idler and the shaft starts to separate, you get vibration in the system. And what the fiber can tell us is an impending alert of, you're gonna have problems with your conveyor up there. You can light the conveyor on fire in places if you get a, a conveyor break, or it can just shut your system down. So we can use this to look for conveyor belt and idler bearing breakdowns. We can use it on pipelines to look for leaks. If we get a leak in a pipeline, in a gas pipeline, the sudden pressure drop causes a temperature change and the leak causes everything to vibrate. So now all of a sudden we get a measurement that, oh, 4.2 kilometers away, there is a leak in the system. We can um, also put this in place to look at compressor vibrations. Um, we'll uh, wrap this around a compressor. So there's a requirement on natural gas turbines and compressors to measure um, periodically inspect them for, compre or for vibration because it's a sign of impending breakdowns. So now we can just wrap this fiber around it and say we can get a measurement of vibration all across the entire compressor rig. And we can also put, use it for perimeter ingress. We can put it along a fence line and tell if people are walking there, if somebody's climbing the fence. So we can use this for perimeter production as well. Oh, got a typo here. Um, we use three different types of spectroscopy down this fiber, what's called Raman spectroscopy, which gives us uh, uh, temperature changes. Strain is measured with what's called Brillouin spectroscopy, and vibration is determined by Raleigh scatter. The, all happens on the fiber. We pulse it, beam a laser down it. We look at the signal that comes back, and we say, 10 kilometers away, there's an unusual vibration going on. Hey, Phil, may I add something? Mm -hmm. So we can go up to 80 kilometers with this and it measures actually every 2.5 centimeters. For I thought that was a typo. They did that as 0.025 and I thought it was point, yeah. should be 0.25. Yeah, they did. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I got to check with those guys on that. I was pretty sure that that was, 
I saw that on one of the presentations, but someplace else it says it's measure every quarter with a half resolution or something like that. So, but yeah, it's, but yeah, 80 kilometers, you know, so it's all, you can do a, a long pipeline run and get measurements all the way along the length of it. Z-gas is another unique instrument. It is a chilled dew point analyzer. So a chilled mirror type, but it uses a special crystal cools the crystal down and allows water and or hydrocarbons to condense on the surface. And then it uses a spectroscopic technique to determine is what's condensing on the surface, is it water or is it hydrocarbons? And so this allows us to do simultaneous water and hydrocarbon dew point measurement in natural gas. So typical applications for this are, are natural gas pipelines, In boiler and turbine protection. Again, turbines don't like to get drops of liquid hydrocarbons showing up in them. So we want to have a good understanding where the dew point is. Does all the measurements at line temperatures and line pressures is basically the National Bureau of Mines standard method for determining what a real dew point is. It's not based on any kind of models or extrapolations. It is a direct measurement of both water and hydrocarbon dew point. Oxygen is one of the most common measurements that is done in process. So you'll see we'll work with different types of oxygen analyzers for different applications. And another one is the Barbon analytical product, uh, an optical luminescence. Um, it's actually what's called a quench fluorescence analyzer. And the beauty of it is it's very specific to oxygen and it can deal with all kinds of interferences. We've used this in streams with up to 55% H2S in them. So, Acidic, corrosive streams, the sensor is very robust. We can measure trace levels, typically down to about one PPM in the gas and down to about one part per billion in the liquids. And so we can use the same technology for gas phase analysis or liquid phase analysis. Common applications have been things like flare gases, fuel gases, hydrocarbon streams, Nitrogen blanketing gases over top of uh, hydrocarbon containing vessels. We're just looking at doing an application for methane blanketing over top of bitumen. And also use it for oxygen detection in liquids. We've actually even done oxygen in oil, uh, methanol, ethanol water. Very common for dissolved oxygen in, in, in water streams. Fast response, poison resisted, very low level detection limits very reliable, robust, very few moving parts. And so at the top, you see a picture of the analyzer at the bottom, a little sample system that was done for a flare system where we had to scrub out some um, potential contaminants and protect that sensor. So again, you know what Insight will do, a, we'll provide the analyzers, of course, but we'll put a sample system around it as needed as well. Is this my poll here, Chelsea? It's actually one back, I'm sorry. Is Steve. it? Okay. Um, All right. A little background, just about your background turned off. Yeah. There we go. Cool. And we're getting close, folks. We shouldn't be too much longer. Probably about, I'm going to probably get about. Six more slides. Okay, we're 13 out of 15 people have answered. So if anybody else wants to pop in, you guys. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna end it here then. We're 14 out of 15 people. Okay. Um, all right, and sharing the results, we have um, so Z gas water and hydrocarbon to do dew point analyzers. Um, we've got seven votes for that one, and then following that, inside analytical dithiazine testing at three um, votes, and then two for alpha omega oxygen analyzers, another two for Costa Zentor aluminum oxide moisture sensors, and then uh, nothing for the prehistorian fiber optic conveyor. Well, wait a second, wait a second. The 
it's important that you know the Praetorians only guarded the emperor. So maybe that changes some votes here, right? And <laughs> the emperor too. I thought I was going to get in trouble. Don't scream at me like that. <laughs> 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 I'm like, I know, I'm mispronouncing everything. I'm sorry, Doug. Yeah. I'm my vote. Did everybody Change your vote, yeah. yeah. It's Doug's important to guard the emperor. Yeah. <laughs> That's Nathan's job. There you go. <laughs> All right, go for it. Cool. Doug. All great. right, so we talked a bit about Barbin. So it's a very unique little auction analyzer, beautiful package, great user interface. Been really happy working with these guys. Um, we just recently brought on the Xrel line. Um, again, I'm very proud to bring on this line. I was back when I had lots of color in my hair um, and I was in university. Um, I started to kind of cut my teeth doing mass spectroscopy. And so these guys are, I think they started uh, as early back as probably, I think it might have been as not the 1600s, 1964 or something like that. Xrel might have been working on one of their first mass spec products. Um, probably the big name in process mass spectrometry. Quadrupole mass specs, very high resolution, very great detection limits. On some applications, they talk about going as low as parts per trillion detection limits. Typical applications have been, I mean, it's hard to even put typical applications fees. Cool story is a friend of mine uh, who's an instrument guy here phones me and says, he says, you know, my, my wife's son is working at the Olympic Training Center. He says, they're having problems with a mass spectrometer. And he knew I'd worked on them before, on mass specs before, and he says, could you come out and take a look at it? So here's a device that I've seen in ammonia plants. I've seen it in refineries. And I go into this medical training facility where they're training Olympic athletes, and they're using it to see how well their lungs are basically processing air, absorbing oxygen, releasing CO2, transfer rate across uh, materials, and it's an extra all process mass spec. So it's hard to talk about typical applications because they are everywhere from the healthcare industry, right through agriculture, um, fertilizer production, oil and gas plants. So a, a very diverse technology can be used in a lot of applications. Mo they're really fast analysis time, you know, typically less than one second. And so you'll see these with um, 16 and 32 port valves. And they'll do 16 sample points and just switch between sample points and do very fast analysis of an entire processing facility. So uh, a beautiful product close to my roots, really happy to bring these guys on board. Another thing that Hawk does, because they, we do so much work with level sensors and flow sensors and pressure sensors, they've got asset monitoring software, cloud-based asset monitoring. So we can either put in um, the Connect 3D or the new Hawkeye 365s and monitor multiple sensors and put that data up onto the web. So it allows you to be able to look at the data that you're getting from all these sensors and bring it all into one place and provide you an easy access to all that data. They support power over ethernet devices, which again, makes it easy for us to network a lot of devices together, but also multiple numbers of other protocols and provide this cloud-based monitoring system. Um, this product was the, the Hawkeye 365 was just recently was nominated for product of the year. And I'm not sure where that got to. Um, I actually have to go back and see what the results of that was. There was a, uh, I think for one of the process control magazines. Vote ends in, uh, in the new year, Phil. Oh, does it? Okay, yeah. thanks, Chris. The last one I have here, I refer to as Inside Innovations and it's, we have a lot of product development going on. Constantly looking at better ways to do things or we hear of a problem from our clients. This is kind of a unique example right down here. We had a client who was um, doing some sampling, pulling samples, lab samples, and vented off the sample to the flare line and left the vent valve open. Unfortunately, it was still contained, connected to the propane tanker. And so he slowly just bled propane out of this propane tanker over an extended period of time. And so we said, well, geez, we should really come up with a little auto shut off valve. So 
Just machine parts that basically allow us with a spring return on two ways and three way valves and make it so if we have valves that we want to have, so you have to manually hold them in place when you want them to be open. And as soon as you let go of them, they automatically go back to their, their sort of fail safe position. Um, so we'll, we'll develop things like that as a product. Solvent flush tanks, back flushing filters. A lot of times on applications with GCs, with any kind of analyzer, we can have a system where waxes and dirt build up on it. And we wanna basically have a way of back flushing that with a solvent that we know can clean off those filters. This is a part, I know it's hard to tell there, it looks like a little, I call it the valve tree, um, but it's, it's basically two double block and bleed systems put into one manifold. They're all gonna sit off of a, a fast loop return probe. So we'll design custom sample probes, custom valve assemblies, 3D printing, 3D modeling, doing fuel, full computational full fluid dynamics analysis of how they're going to work, engineer them for success, build them and produce them. So you're going to see in the new year, you're going to probably see our, I'm going to mention about our website going to be coming up, but you're going to see a lot of these products we're going to try to make as just for order off the website. Some of them which don't require any additional engineering. All right, I think we have a poll there too, Chelsea. Sorry, there we go. All right, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Cool. Okay, we've got 13 out of 15 answered. If anybody's left, guys, go for it and jump in. Otherwise, we'll probably end this one. Cool. All right, groovy. Okay, so we've got um, Inside Innovations Custom Products uh, is at the top with six. And then, mm. woo! Um, extra quadrupole mass spectrometers for four, and then barbon oxygen analyzers for three, and then uh, zero for hot cloud-based asset monitoring. Oh, okay. All right, so I got this little slide. It's just gonna animate it. It just goes through, it's got a typo on it. Ah, uh, capabilities. Um, just sort of shows a bunch of the systems that we put together in different applications. I think I just wanna talk about here is Although we talk about particular products, what we really like to look at is integrated solutions, systems we can build to solve a problem for people in the field. And we'll build this from as small as a little regulator panel for a gas processing application to complete analyzer buildings or metering skids. And we're happy to put, to deal with whatever application you have and look for a system that we can put in to, uh, to meet all your requirements. And again, this is one of my Favorite shots, I always give Dougie credit for this one when I see it because, you know, we've got two of our composite samplers sitting over here, solvent flush tank, PLC controlling automated samplers, infrared analyzer, and it's sort of all of our stuff in this building that is just a system that we're really proud to say we have out there in the field doing measurement for our clients. Chelsea mentioned that we there's a bit of a surprise to all of this too. A little bit of, we wanted to get this uh, this webinar in, done in before Christmas. And um, part of the reason is this, is that although we like to develop lots of new products, we also decided we should do our own beer. And so we have announced that we will be putting out these insightful beers. And we would love to get all of you people who have attended to be able to ship you a four pack of these. So if you will, um, contact one of my sales guys, Chelsea, myself. The guys um, to follow up with you guys too. And this yeah. obviously there's some people that couldn't make it. So they're gonna get the recording and the boys will follow up with them. So Scotty or Chris will be in touch to get your guys' addresses and also coordinate when the best time is for them to actually be. Um, hold on, let me phone a friend. <laughs> <Chris>. <laughs> Yeah. Could have started with that, Phil. We've got we'd have thousands of people on this. Yeah, I know. Everybody was going. I'm going to register 14 times for this webinar. Yeah. 
Uh, so the gentleman will be in touch with you guys. Um, for <laughs>